Hi, and welcome to TV Africa News, and thank you for joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najma Luima, but first are the top stories. Joy as Ugandan stranded in Sudan finally return home. Mpuga demands action reports from ministers over brutalization of female MPs. Fears over food and security mount as fragile ceasefire holds in Sudan. Vipers pitted against bright stars in old UPL affair. Welcome once again now the news in detail. It was hugs and cheers on Thursday night as Uganda Ugandans who had been stranded in Sudan after outbreak of clashes between rival military functions finally returned home. Uganda now joins several other countries that have in the past evacuated their citizens who had been stranded in Khartoum. We have more. At 2.30 a.m., the group of 211 working and living in Sudan and in the company of External Security Organization Director General Ambassador Joseph Ochuet arrived at Entebbe International Airport aboard a Uganda Airlines bus. The group, including diplomats, students and business expatriates who arrived from Bashilda Airport in northern Ethiopia, where they had been picked by the Uganda Airlines, were received by the Senior Presidential Advisor on Special Operations, Jenom Hose Kainerugaba, who had been designated by President Museven to take charge of the rescue operation. Whereas an estimated 300 Ugandans are said to be stranded in Sudan following the outbreak of the fighting between rival military factions, Uganda's Ambassador to Khartoum, Dr. Rashid Yahya Semudu, said last night that a comprehensive assessment of the country's citizens still trapped in Sudan will be made after the first evacuation to see who else needs assistance. The evacuation of 211 Ugandans followed President Museveni's directive to General Mohozi Kainerugaba to coordinate the mission and to this, the President also directed that a Uganda Airlines bus be dispatched to help pick the stranded Ugandans. The leader of opposition, Matthias Sempoga, has called for an immediate accountability from different ministers regarding the brutality meted on different opposition women MPs. For the past few days, the media has been awash by videos and pictures of last week's brutal arrest of Bovuma woman MP Susan Nakaziba Mugabe and several others who had gathered to celebrate the belated Women's Day celebrations in in Bovoma district. On Wednesday, opposition female members of parliament petitioned the Speaker of Parliament, Anita Among, regarding the brutal arrests meted on them at different events organized to celebrate the International Women's Day in their respective districts. The MPs contend uh, the actions and conduct of the security personnel under the command of the resident district commissioners are systematically made to block them from interfacing with their constituents. The MPs now want Speaker Among to join them in the demonstration against their ill treatment and the ministers of security, defense and internal affairs to be summoned to explain why women legislators are being battered heartlessly. Mpuga demanded that the concerned ministers should urgently make preliminary explanations as to what steps they have taken to apprehend the police, army officers and others involved in the violence. In response, the deputy speaker said that consultations would be made regarding the issue raised by the leader of the opposition. The violence in Sudan has impacted the free flow of goods in the country, leading to an insufficient food supply amidst a worsening battle between two army generals. The United Nations recently warned of dire shortages of food, water, medicine and fuels, especially in Khartoum and the neighboring surroundings. Thousands of residents have fled the chaos, but the remaining majority are now facing inadequate food supply, with prices skyrocketing in a country that was already in dire situation before the violence began. The fighting has killed at least 549 people and wounded more than 4,000, according to the UN agencies. A total of 14 hospitals have been shelled since fighting erupted, as the remaining people scramble for the few resources. According to Akijuao Akwani, a construction worker from South Sudan, they are worried about the prices and worried about where to go. 
He said that the problem is that the danger comes to them, the civilians who are suffering and living in those conditions. The fighting between the rival generals, which has involved airstrikes and artillery exchanges, has killed hundreds of people and left some neighborhoods of greater Kaltum in ruins. Let's take a quick break. We shall be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still watching TV Africa News, The Right to Know. A former head of the al Bashir's regime in Sudan, wanted for crimes against humanity, has announced that he fled prison with other former collaborators in this country in full of chaos. According to the AME, former leader Omar al Bashir did not flee with his lieutenants because he is currently in the hospital. The army announced on Wednesday that Ahmed Harun, one of his lieutenants wanted by the International Criminal Court, he had escaped with others from Kobel prison in the capital, Khartoum. The army assures that four other soldiers accused for June 30th, the coup d'etat of Bashir in 1989, have also been in the Alia hospital of the armed forces since before the start of the fighting on April 15 between the two ruling generals in Khartoum. In a speech recorded on Sudanese television on Tuesday evening, Ahmed Harun, also wanted by the ICC, said that former officials of the Bashir regime were no longer in detention. He is wanted by the ICC for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Dafa, western Sudan. A conflict erupted there in 2003 between Khartoum and members of non-Arab ethnic minorities, which left some 300,000 dead and 2.5 million displaced, according to the UN. Harun's escape is the latest reported jailbreak since the army and paramilitary group Rapid Support Forces began fighting on April 15th. Moving on, Morocco has recorded a record number of arrivals in the first quarter of 2023 with uh, the latest figures from the tourism ministry showing it attracted 2.9 million tourists in the three-month period. The figures represent an increase of 17% compared to the first quarter of pre-COVID 2019. Almost 2 million people visited Morocco in February alone, a whopping 464% rise over the same period in 2022. Data compiled by the Ministry of Tourism, Handcraft and Social and Solidarity Economy attributes the upward trend to the growth in outbound tourism markets, including in Spain, Britain, Italy and the United States. The ministry has plans to boost tourism with a new roadmap launched on 17th March, which it hopes will attract 17.5 million tourists and create 200,000 new jobs by 2026. Building on various initiatives it has carried out with the National Tourism Office to boost tourism, the ministry has vowed to redouble efforts towards improving marketing and reinforcing air connectivity throughout 2023. Away from that, eight uh, veteran Senegalese riflemen will be finally returning home for good this Friday after President Emmanuel Macron's government in January lifted a six-month residency uh, condition for their military pension. For 95-year-old Yoro Diawo, after nearly 20 years of living thousands of miles from his family, he is happy to leave his tiny studio in a suburb of Paris to return to his family. The much-decorated soldier, who in 2017 was awarded France's highest honor, the Legion de Honor, fought in both Indochina and Algeria. Hundreds of thousands of African soldiers fought for France in the two world wars and against independence 
independence movements in Indochina and Algeria. But until uh, this year, surviving veterans among uh, the so-called Senegalese infantrymen had to live in France for half the year or lose their pension. In January, the French state dropped the condition, saying they could return home for good and continue receiving their monthly allowance of 950 euros. It said it would also pay for the flight and move of any veterans wishing to leave. But for most, it is too late with only a few dozen of the former riflemen are still alive and some of them are too frail to return home. In our business news today, the South African state-owned electricity company, ESCOM, is costing an average of 55 million U.S. dollars a month in corruption with the company uh, burdened with debt and unable to produce enough power for the country's energy crisis, according to the company's former chief executive. In a remote interview with a parliamentary committee on public accounts, Andre de Ruta confirmed his statements on the level of corruption at ESCOM in a document he submitted. For months, South Africa's 60 million people have been without power for up to 12 hours a day. The continent's leading industrial power is unable to draw enough electricity from ESCOM's antiquated and poorly maintained power stations, and the situation could worsen with the onset of the southern winter and an increase in demand. The power crisis is costing the economy some 50 million US dollars a day in lost generation, according to the government. After years of mismanagement and corruption under President Jacob Zuma between 2009 and 2018, ESCOM now has a debt of 422 billion rand, currently the equivalent of nearly 23 billion US dollars, which the government is trying to pay off. South Africa still gets 80% of its electricity from coal. A 98 billion US dollar investment plan was approved by rich countries last year at COP27 as part of an agreement for a just transition to clean energy. And in our health news today, the World Health Organization said on Wednesday that COVID-19 deaths had dropped by 95% since the start of the year. However, it warned that the virus was still on the move and countries would have to learn how to manage its ongoing non-emergency effects, including the post-COVID-19 condition along COVID. Speaking during a press conference, the World Health Organization Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that they are very encouraged by the sustained decline in reported dates from COVID-19, which have dropped 95% since the beginning of this year. He, however, said that some countries are seeing increases, and over the past four weeks, 14,000 people lost their lives to this disease. He added that the emergence of the new XBB.1.16 variant illustrates that the virus was still changing and was still capable of of causing new waves of disease and death. Tedros added that an estimated 1 in 10 infections resulted in long COVID, suggesting that hundreds of millions of people would need longer-term care. He said, however, that the World Health Organization remained hopeful that it would be able to declare an end to COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern when its advisory committee convenes next month.
And finally, with the sports news today, Viper Sports Club will face Saltillo Bright Stars in the semi finals of the year's Tanbik Uganda Cup. The two teams featuring in Uganda Premier League were pitted against each other in the semi final draws conducted on Thursday morning at Fofa House Mengo. We have more with Nalugo. The Venoms, who are seeking to play a third successful final, will have to negotiate past Bright Stars. Bright Stars under Asaf Mwelaze is the only team yet to concede a goal in this year's edition. And they will be hoping to repeat their heroics they made in 2019 when they reached the final only to lose the Pro Line FC in the final. To reach this stage, Bright Stars eliminated KCC AFC while Vipers negotiated past Calvary. The other semi final is between Police FC and Ajumani Town Council, both from the FUFA Big League. A Germany have had a torrid season in the FUFA Big League, languishing in the drop zone, but this has been the opposite in the cup competition. They will be hoping to continue with their Cinderella story as they face Police FC. Police dumped out holders Bull FC while a Germany ejected Express FC at the quarter-final stage. The first legs of the semi-finals will be played on 14th and 15th May, while the return legs will come between 20th and 27th of the same month. That was the news. Thank you for always keeping it TV Africa. Please do stay tuned.